you read about skeletons, how would you tell people that you person? How would you decide? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. 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 I'm back with another speculative evolution update. Sorry these are so infrequent, but they take a lot of effort to make, so I'm doing what I can. Anyway, we got six new creatures for you, so sit back, relax, and listen to what's next. Okay, first up we have Bossio Maximus. Bossio Magno kept increasing in size. It slowly started to grow taller than the water level. It kept getting thicker and sturdier. This led them to becoming the tree-like organisms they are today, Bossio Maximus. Pictured here, a stand of Bossio Maximus and Terra Bossio absorb as much water as they can from a seasonal stream on the southwestern side of Kubshai. Creature design by Zord. The rhizoid is mostly underground. It buries deep into the ground to provide support for the trunk and to absorb a larger amount of nutrients. It has retained a crown leaf at its top, which is the largest one, and it has protruding branches which grow one leaf of their own to absorb more light. It has an extensive root system from which other trunks may sprout into Bossio Maximus of their own. It is one massive subterranean organism which reproduces by expanding. While the primary form of reproduction of Bossio maximus is clonal vegetative growth, if there has been a particularly good year, then a stand of Bossio may grow clusters of spores at the center of the top leaf pad. These will blow away in the wind, and if they hit the leaf pads of other Bossio maximus, they may fertilize the small spores that coat the surface of the leaves in a fine dusting. If this occurs, the new haploid spore will begin to grow. With the Bossio maximus it is on, feeding it nutrients. Eventually, it will grow a long filament and be carried off by the wind to found a new stand of Bossio Maximus. The extensive root system at times produces a new shoot that pokes out of the ground and begins to grow. At first, it looks like the ancestral Bossio. They don't have to grow in the water, but they do need to be nearby it. As time passes, it starts to grow... As time passes, they start to grow wider and gain new branches that keep growing with the trunk until they reach maturity. Bossio Maximus can be found anywhere they can get enough water on Kubshai. Genetic Ancestor? Bossio Magno. Scientific name? Palmatum suorum. Origin? Retinal phyta. Lifespan? Each trunk can last about 25 local years under optimum conditions. Height? 8 meters. Next up, we have the puffball. The puffball is a small halophytic retinal phyte that grows in clumps on beaches around southern Arctica, Yama, and Kubshai. It is a common site in estuaries, salt marshes, and near the coast. Puffballs grow quickly and die young, but provide a source of nutrients to many coastal and marsh dwellers. Pictured here, a stand of puffballs on the western coast of Yama soak up some salt and late morning sunshine. Creature design by Dapper Dino. Puffballs are much reduced compared to their Bossio Magno ancestors. Their round leaves are completely gone, and now they are just a clump of stems that photosynthesize. The stems share a central bulb that itself sends off root-like branches into the substrate. The bulb is hollow, as are the filaments. This simple system of hollow spaces allows water to diffuse throughout the organism, as well as nutrients to diffuse out of the photosynthetic fibers. Bertsa bruo yemenensis is characterized by particularly thin curly filaments. B. arctos has particularly thick filaments, and unlike other species, it goes into a quote-unquote hibernation period during the local winter where the filaments die off. Only with the return of regular sunlight does it grow a second coat of filaments and prepare for reproduction. B. australis has straight filaments and a prominent bulb which can sometimes stick partially out of the substrate in particularly large individuals. B. borealis is nearly identical to B. australis, but they reproduce at opposite times of the year and are separated geographically. Puffballs have mostly given up on vegetative growth, although it can happen if the organism gets big enough and its roots extend out far enough. Instead, each bulb has an internal cavity where spores are stored. As the puffball approaches the end of its lifespan, the bulb will burst open with some force, releasing a cloud of spores. This always happens around the local summer solstice, and when spores meet each other, they will form a new embryo, which may form a new puffball if it lands in appropriate soil. A new spore that lands on suitable soil will, within a local day, Send one shoot up and one shoot down. The upward shoot will become the first filament and the downward shoot the first root, and will later expand into a tuber-like structure. After about four local days, the bulb will have expanded and the organism will now have a few dozen filaments as well as additional root structures radiating out from the bulb. At about a local year of growth, the pace of which depends on the suitability of the soil, it will begin to prepare for reproduction. Being halophiles, puffballs are always found near salty or brackish water. Most often they are found on coasts, estuaries, salty lakes, etc. Each of the four species in genus Bertsabruo has its own geographical range. B. yamanensis, Yama. B. arctos, Southern Arctica. B. australis, Temperate Southern Kubshai. B. borealis, Temperate Northern Kubshai. Genetic ancestor, Bossio magno. Scientific name, Bertsabruo species. Origin, retinal phyta. 
lifespan, one local year. Average height, 32 centimeters, although some may reach up to 40 centimeters in height. Next up, we come to the Remipede. On an overcast day, the marshlands of eastern Kubshai, a stand of Terabasio, carpets the moist ground. The silhouette of a centipede-like creature could just about be seen slithering through the undergrowth. Obscured by the shadows, casted by the purple leaves, despite its sinister appearance, the creature is actually a placid herbivore, searching for fallen retinal fights to gnaw on. Remipedes are terrestrial herbivores of medium size, feeding on all sorts of fresh and decaying retinal fights on land. Though fairly slow moving, their thick exoskeleton protects them from many predators. Remipedes belong to a group of multi xenosegmentins known as ectisopods, which also includes the closely related Romulopedes. Pictured here, a Remipede is approaching the end of a terabasial plant to nibble on it. Creature design by Squidum. Remipedes got their extremely long body due to duplicate segmentation of the ancestral analopod's posterior segment, reaching a total length of 18 segments in adult specimens. Remipedes possess an exoskeleton of keratin, with particularly tough plating on the dorsal side. The underside and the limbs are also covered in a thinner layer of exoskeleton, with the limbs featuring distinct joints to still allow a degree of movement. The anterior most compound eyes are situated laterally on either side of the Remipede's head, while the much reduced simple eyes on the second segment remain facing upwards. The head possesses a pair of thick and serrated mandibles, which are adapted for chewing on tough retinal fight matter. Two pairs of short antennae branch from the base of the mandibles and extend downwards, with chemoreceptors located at the distal portions of each antenna. To facilitate respiration on land, the Remipedes possess a pair of book lungs within each segment, with openings for each bulk lung situated on the posterior ventral margin of the segment. The long body of the Remipede houses an equally long digestive tract, which improves the efficiency of breaking down retinal fight matter and extracting nutrients. Remipedes also possess an open circulatory system with one heart-like pumping organ per segment, as well as a simple nervous system of a rudimentary brain at the head and two nerve cords trailing down the rest of the body. Though Remipedes are sequential hermaphrodites, their male-female sex is genetically determined. The genetically female will remain anatomically female their entire lives, while the genetically male will initially emerge automatically female before undergoing a sex transition at some point in its life. During mating, the male and female align themselves laterally next to each other, touching their cloacal openings together to transfer sperm to the female. Fertilized eggs are typically laid in clusters within dark and moist environments, with most locations being underneath some retinal fight litter. Newly hatched remipedes start off at 1 cm in length, and with only four segments in total, with the posterior most segment being small and underdeveloped. A developing remipede must molt its exoskeleton to grow larger, which occurs roughly every 30 local days. Molting is achieved by fission between the dorsal half and the ventral half of the old exoskeleton, allowing the two halves to be peeled away. Recently molted remipedes are soft skinned and require some amount of time before the new exoskeleton will harden, with larger remipedes having longer periods of vulnerability. Successful molting results in a new posterior segment being added onto the body along with an overall larger body size. Remipedes reach full maturity once they have grown all 18 segments and reached 10 centimeters in length, which takes around two local years of growth. Adult remipedes will continue to molt regularly and grow larger for the rest of their lives, but will not gain any additional segments in doing so. A genetically male remipede will undergo a female to male transition when it molts at around the age of five years. Remipedes are able to regenerate wounds and lost limbs over successive molts. Remipedes inhabit the eastern regions of Kubshai acting as low-grazing herbivores. Larger adults are more prevalent on the surface, while the small and vulnerable young hide from predators among the ground litter. Though remipedes are terrestrial throughout their entire lives, they are still dependent on ambient humidity to maintain the function of their book lungs. As such, they are most commonly found in moist environments with lots of vegetation, such as marshlands. The anterior pair of compound eyes grants mediocre vision abilities, while the posterior pair can only detect the differences in light levels. Perception of surroundings depends more on the antennae, which are capable of tracking down a variety of pheromones from retinal fights or other remipedes. The antennae function by tapping the chemoreceptor line tips on the substrate and tasting for pheromones. Small, invisible setae lining the whole body can also sense disturbances in air currents, potentially caused by the movement of larger creatures. Genetic ancestor? Ypresi. Scientific name? Proceragaster barduni. Origin? Xenosegmenta. Lifespan? 12 local years. Average height, 3 centimeters. Average length, 25 centimeters. Now we come to the Spring Heel. Yama is a bit of an island continent, and while there is overlap in its fauna with Kubshai, there are also some unique organisms. One is the Spring Heel. The Spring Heel is an ambush predator adapted to a life on land. It is quite small, but also quite fierce. They hunt their prey using their cryptic earth tone coloration, 
and will leap with surprising force and speed toward their prey, killing them with their barbed tusks and toothed proboscis. Pictured here, one spring heel has jumped after some out of frame prey, while another prepares for a similar leap. Creature design by Dapper Dino. Spring heels have Spring heels have an anatomy similar to Longakura, maintaining its proboscis, its tusk-like feelers, dorsal projection, all four limbs, eye stalks, and tail. The proboscis now sports some hard teeth used to hold prey that is being eaten, allowing the tusk-like feelers to act like a two-part lower jaw. To facilitate this use of the tusks, they have developed dorsal spikes which are curved posteriorly, making them similar in some ways to theropod teeth in shape and function. The legs have gained jointing using a hydrostatic system to keep the segments rigid. Interestingly, to human eyes, these legs seem to bend backwards, with their bending being opposite to that seen in earth tetrapods. The back legs are bigger and closer to the center line. They are used to propel the organism forward in the air. The front legs are widely spaced and smaller, and used to cushion the landing of the spring heel. The tail has a similar look to that of the only distantly related gill cords. The similarity is convergent, and the internal anatomy of the tail differs significantly. Each side has 11 spiracles which lead to a central tube that itself leads to a posterior lung sac. This sac is kept moist internally, and the spring heel does not need to soak its tail in water, like most terrestrial gill cores of its time. However, it must drink water frequently to stay hydrated. This lung is surrounded by muscles that will compress it, but the breathing is also aided by limb movement. In fact, a resting spring heel not on the hunt will bob up and down to help its lung be more efficient. The dorsal fin now plays no role in respiration, but it retains a lot of blood vessels and is used for display, thermal regulation, and also to aid in stability when leaping through the air. Spring heels are sexually reproducing diploid organisms with internal fertilization. The mating individuals will face away from each other with their cloacas touching, at which point the male will transfer a packet of sperm contained in a membrane that the female will then use to fertilize her eggs. Mating happens around autumn. A single female may mate three to four times during a single mating season. Eggs are held internally in batches of about a dozen that will develop internally for approximately six days. When they hatch, the mother will put them into a pool of fresh water where they will grow for about 45 days, feeding on small organisms both heterotrophic and autotrophic until they are large enough and mature enough to come onto land. Spring heels are adaptable and live in a variety of habitats all around Yama, but require access to fresh water and so are not found in arid environments. Spring heels eat mostly other xenometazoans. They also take in small amounts of food in the form of retinal phytes. This provides them with important micronutrients, such as the minerals they need for their hard parts, as well as some additional simple sugars. The eyes on stalks are excellently tuned for detecting motion, but do not have a particularly great angular resolution, and spring heels are dichromats. In terms of chemoreception, the feelers are now useless, and the proboscis has taken over that function, now functioning as a taste organ. As a result, the spring heels have only a weak ability to sense chemicals in the water or air, which is not too much of a problem, as they are primarily visual diurnal hunters. Genetic ancestor, Longakura. Scientific name, Saltimus indominus. Origin, Pseudotetrapoda. Lifespan, four local years. Average length, three centimeters. And now we come to the tiger snail. Amongst the Kelifoichthians, there are some organisms that never evolved to take to the water column. Rather, they strove to perfect the benthic lifestyle of their closest relatives and ancestral species. Of this, of this lineage, one taxon is known to exist currently. Portocalifos portocali, the tiger snail. Pictured here, a tiger snail inches across a rock at high tide in the intertidal zone around northern Kubshai. Creature design by lethal cuteness. The tiger snail's anatomy is believed to be quite similar to the ancestor of its clade. The radula and esophagus are both still present, however the natidia are now located in a large water-filled pouch, natidian coelum, that is separated from the esophagus by two valved tubes. Water flows into this pouch from one tube oriented towards the front of the esophagus, and it exits through another tube that empties out into the mouth itself. This system has allowed the organism to have a unidirectional current flowing along its natidia while protecting them from particles far more effectively, overall improving its respiratory system dramatically. This pouch has also expanded in size quite significantly, so much so that it is now located majorly in the body tagma. Consequently, the tiger snail has lost its external gills entirely. All that is left of them are vestigial bumps along the underside of its body. In terms of tagmatization, the tiger snail has begun to undergo a merging of the head and body tagmata to some degree as the two now have an overlapping zone referred to as the intertagma. Within the intertagma rests the natidian coelum, as well as the entrance to the stomach, and numerous muscles that enable the creature's head to extend outwards or be retracted into the shell. While both the crania and the abdominal tagma remain distinct, this overlapping could be indicative of the early stages of tagma reduction. The posterior tagma has expanded significantly compared to its ancestors, and is now the largest tagma in terms of length, composing almost half of the creature's entire length. This tagma is now mostly dedicated to shell production, 
However, it also houses the gonads. The posterior anus has been relocated to the abdominal tagma, with the intestinal tract no longer entering the posterior at all. The rearmost forelimbs have moved forward on the organism to keep them outside the shell. The posterior anus opens up between the hind forelimbs, allowing deposition of waste and mobility along the seafloor. An additional advancement has been made in the form of a hard, bony structure on the surface of the head, which serves as a seal and protective carapace when the head and body retract into the shell. This allows for the shell to be effectively sealed when the organism is threatened, as the shell itself lacks a valve seal or enough depth to offer such protection on its own. The digestive gland of the organism has also undergone modifications to allow a significantly increased production of psilocytes, cells filled with citric acid that are specialized to transport silicates to enable faster shell growth. Additionally, an increase in symbiotic microbes allows the tiger snail to utilize them as a means of performing the glyoxylate cycle, a process that allows the conversion of fats and fatty acids into carbohydrates, thus enabling it to avoid needing to break down proteins to create glucose to some extent. Tiger shells are diploid simultaneous hermaphroditic organisms with a year-round mating season. Much like the tiger shells, tiger snails are solitary organisms that mate whenever they encounter another member of their species. However, rather than engaging in a wrestling match where the winner fertilizes the eggs of the loser, tiger snails fertilize both parties' eggs externally. When two tiger snails encounter each other, each will lay their eggs into a small nest dug into the sediment. The eggs are laid from the abdominal anus into a clutch of about 10 eggs, which are then fertilized by the other party and buried in the sediment. After this, the mated organisms will abandon the eggs and will refrain from mating for at least three local days. During this time, they will secrete pheromones into the water as a means of signaling to other members of the species that they are unable to mate. This serves the dual purpose of alerting other members of the species to their location, thus when they are able to mate again, potential mates will be close by, as well as ensuring that they are not approached while they replenish their gametes. Tiger snail eggs hatch after about 14 local days, after which they will dig themselves out of the sediment. While they resemble miniature adults in many ways, their gametes are wholly underdeveloped, their posterior tagma is not elongated, and they lack an external shell. In order to survive this phase of life, the tiger snail naiad remains nocturnal, relying on the cover of darkness to protect themselves. It is likely that they will mainly subsist off retinal fight sap and small bits of carrion that they can burrow themselves into. 80% of all naiads born will die during this phase of life. Should these organisms survive long enough to develop their shells, approximately 30 local days, they will have reached a size of about 6 to 8 centimeters in length. While they are still incapable of reproduction in this phase, they are identical to adults in all other ways. They will continue to grow for the rest of their lives, although their growth rate will slow significantly after around one local year. By this point, they have usually approached their adult size, though are usually a centimeter or two smaller, and their gametes are fully developed. Tiger shells evolved along the eastern coastlines of Kubshai and have since radiated out from this location. Fossils can be found from the later portions of this phase all across those coastlines of Kubshai and southern Arctica. Occasionally, fossils can be found around the coast of western Nylon, However, such finds are incredibly rare. It is likely that at this time the tiger snails were just starting to adapt to the sulfur-rich waters around Neelan. Tiger shells are omnivorous animals and feed on a wide variety of organic material. Most commonly, they can be found grazing on small retinal phytes and phytozoans, as well as drinking the sap from phytozoan plants. This is unlike the tiger snails who prefer the sap of retinal phytes. Unlike tiger shells, however, tiger snails cannot rear up through the use of the posterior tagma, thus limiting them to small retinal phytes and phytozoans growing along the substrate. Tiger shells also require animal tissue as a fundamental part of their diet. It is their main source of protein. However, they are not known to be predatory. Rather, tiger snails gain protein by consuming carrion they find while scavenging. When carrion is found, tiger snails are known to burrow into the carcass, if it is large enough, as a means of avoiding being forced away from the carcass by other scavengers. After burrowing into the corpse, they will slowly consume it from the inside out before moving on to find more plant matter to consume. The tiger snail has undergone several minor advancements to its eye structure. While the opsin clusters are not present in the Kelifoichthians, due to gene AO15, the camera type eye have adapted to take on the roles that these opsin clusters take on in other cephaloptins. In particular, the optical nerves have segregated themselves to specialize in the transmission of specific types of visual stimuli. The uppermost nerve transmits information regarding light levels to a small nerve cluster located behind the eye, which analyzes this information as a means of tracking the day-night cycle and seasons. This information is in turn submitted to the central brain for analysis and use. The lowermost portion of the optical nerves are dedicated to the transmission of visual stimuli regarding individual colors, which are analyzed by another nerve cluster at the base of the eye stalks for analysis. The information is then submitted to the brain, allowing the tiger snail to carefully analyze visual stimuli in a highly comprehensive, efficient manner. Tiger shells rely on prokaryotic microbes and other microbial organisms to perform the glyoxylate cycle with fatty acids provided by the tiger snail. This process enables a tiger snail to be able to convert fats directly into carbohydrates and glucose without having to break down 
as much protein to sustain its glucose levels during times of starvation. This also allows the tiger snail to make better use of lipids consumed from carrion when opportunistically scavenging. Genetic ancestor, Xenoyuli kirby. Scientific name, Portocalifos portocali. Origin, Xenosegmenta. Lifespan, 7 local years. Average height, 8 centimeters. Average length, 15 centimeters. Last, and perhaps least, we have Zykin. 460 million years ago, Almaysia was a warm planet with no permanent ice. However, that's not to say that there was never ice. And in the long Arctic in winter, snowfall, frost, and hail are far from unknown. Across the continent, on rocks, can be found a faint purplish tint. Primarily in the crevices, closer examination will reveal tiny plaque-like purple growths. These are zykin colonies, a group of retinophytes that have a lifestyle similar to earth lichens. They absorb carbon and water from the atmosphere, grow on nearly anything that provides a lasting hold, and eke out a meager existence. Pictured here, various zykin colonies hang to the crevices of rock in the highlands of Arctica during a snowstorm. Creature design by Dapper Dino. The anatomy of xenomycosids is very simple. They have filaments that grow through tiny cracks in whatever substrate they live on, and a broad, flat, thin growth section. When a growth section covers enough area, it will start sending down filaments to further anchor itself. Xenomycosids use very little water and have an extremely slow metabolism. They grow only at most a centimeter a local year in any given direction, and exist in some of the most inhospitable areas on Almaysia, such as Arctic mountains or deep in interior deserts. Those that live in human environments can grow and reproduce more quickly, but also often produce foul-tasting or even poisonous compounds to deter organisms from feeding on them. Any given zykin colony is likely to be haploid, as all zykins release haploid spores occasionally. Sometimes these spores manage to meet each other and combine to form a diploid colony, which is visually indistinguishable from the haploid colony. The only difference tends to be that diploid colonies tend to be less prone to disease and can sometimes grow faster. Most of the growth of zykin colonies is vegetative growth, and if one section of zykin is disconnected from another section, effectively there are now two colonies, and both can continue to survive just fine. A spore, whether haploid or diploid, can begin absorbing chemicals from the air and substrate right away, and will begin growth immediately upon resting on some surface. Typically those that land on convex surfaces end up being blown away before they can lay down anchoring filaments. It is for this reason that zykins are usually only found in shallow crevices in rocks. This allows them less sunlight, but given their slow metabolisms, this is not a problem. They don't need much. A spore will typically be about 2 centimeters in diameter after a local year of growth. At this point, it will begin to give off its own spores continuously through life. Zykins are often extremophiles and can be found all over Yama and Arctica. Well, that's it for today. I hope you really enjoyed this. I am thinking about moving down to 6 organisms rather than 8 per video in an effort to get these out more often. Tell me what you think about that in the comments. Also, if you like this video, please hit like. If you didn't like it, hit dislike and tell me what you didn't like. Please, if you haven't already, subscribe and use the bell icon to turn on all notifications so you're always notified when there's new Dapper Dino content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. I just want to take a second to thank my channel members and patrons, especially those pledging $20 and above. Bob Knob, Bent Hovind, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Res Instance. My channel members and patrons help make this channel possible, and without their support, this channel really wouldn't exist. If you would like to help support the channel as a member or patron, there are links in the description to both join the channel as well as join the Patreon. Patrons and members get mentioned in these credit scenes, as well as getting early access to my scripted videos, and if you pledge $10 or above, you can also get access to various 3D assets that I create for Blender, both for use in the channel, as well as just general giveaways to my supporters to help in any Blender projects they might have. If a monthly or annual pledge isn't for you, then there is also a merch store linked in the description, and if none of that's right for you, please just like and subscribe because every like and subscription really helps the video out. Thank you.